Thank you everybody for coming to this uh, housing forum. Uh, just by way of background, about three years ago, uh, during one of my evaluations with annual evaluation with the board, we talked about issues and things that we need to discuss and we just passed a bond and uh, we noticed that there was a increasing um, rents in uh, Sonoma County and this is back in 2015, you know. And one of the goals that the board asked me to put down was to begin the process of um, looking at pro uh, bringing back residential uh, dorms to Santa Rosa Junior College. And this is something for those so-called old timers or veterans remember living in the dorms that there used to be dorms on campus, but they were taking da taken down um, for various reasons. And uh, uh, at that time, there wasn't a real great need for affordable student housing. Today there is. And then you fast forward, um, yesterday, of course, was the anniversary of the, of the firestorm, and uh, that punctuated going from a crisis to a real emergency, you know, urgency. So uh, what we've done is we formulated uh, a group uh, to look at housing that's comprised of a working group of faculty, staff, administrators, and we've also um, uh, made an investment in bringing in some experts, uh, Skyon, uh, which is a nationally recognized firm. They went through a competitive bid process and were selected, and they did a, um, a needs assessment in the fall, in the spring of last year, and they'll share the results with you today. So today we want to kind of tell you where, we, where we've been at, um, where we think we're going, and most importantly, to hear from you in terms of what do you think. So at this point, I'll turn it over to our Vice President of Student Services, Pedro Avila. Thank you. So I just want to take a minute to, uh, well, first of all, welcome all of you to our, our housing forum. And this is an opportunity for us to collect more input from our community. But I do want to take a minute and recognize everyone who's been part of our housing work group. And this project started uh, more than a year ago. Uh, back in August, we convened this work group of people that were interested in talking about, you know, how do we find solutions to address housing and security for our students? Uh, something that is very personal for some of us. And I think everybody on this work group was, uh, had um, a lot of personal um, interest in, in addressing that issue because of our backgrounds and things that we've gone through. Um, but anyways, I just, want to, I just want to recognize this group. It's a very diverse group. It represents all of our different groups, including uh, faculty, students, our classified staff, uh, management. Um, so we first convened in August of last year, and we had really good conversations. And then the fires happened. And when we came back after the fires, we realized that we really needed to expedite this project. And we also realized that we couldn't do it by ourselves. So we decided that we needed to hire an expert. So like Dr. Chong said, we did a request for proposal. Uh, we had three companies that submitted bids. We interviewed two of them. And uh, it was a unanimous decision by the group to hire Scion because of their expertise in advising colleges and universities across the nation on student housing. So we're very excited about this partnership with Scion. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Robert, who's been our lead. He's been a very critical lead uh, working with Scion and definitely the right person and has the right energy and the, the, the contact with our students. And you know, I, I think our Scion partners really enjoy that, that contact with Robert. So I'm gonna turn it over to Robert, who's gonna introduce Scion. Thank you. Thanks, Pedro. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. Got all those housing advocates out there. They didn't plant anybody in the audience, right? No, we're good. Hey, you know, we've been talking about housing. I was just talking to Kathy Matthews probably for three or four years when students first started to come in and, and the antidotes from the community that, you know, we're, we're challenged. We can't find a place to live. We can't afford a place if we find it. Uh, some of us are living in cars. Some of us are in transitional housing. Some of us are on the streets, actually students right now who are on the streets. And so uh, we began talking and uh, that was the, the genesis of what became the Student Resource Center, which De Deanna uh, Rogers in the audience is now coordinating. And there's a connection to the county now. We have resources that we can give out to students. We can't provide them housing, but we can give them resources. And she's connected with the database with the county so that we can track students and work with the county on uh, providing those resources. We have the off-campus housing web pages. Actually, I was remembering a little bit of history that this program was created when we did away with housing in the early 2000s. The money that was used in some of their operational accounts was then used to start our off-campus housing 
uh, web pages. So we can provide landlords and a place to go and put their housing and students a place to go and search for housing. But when you don't have any housing in the community, you have very, very limited housing in the community, that's really hard to do. So I think all of that's led to a conversation, what is our responsibility to do uh, as an institution who brings students from out of the area, who have students that can't afford to live here, uh, our own students within Sonoma County who can't find a place to live, what is our responsibility? Is it to provide housing? We didn't know the answer to that question. We think there's demand, but we hired Scion in order to tell us that. And so we asked them to do, really look at five things for us. Uh, demand analysis, basically, is there enough demand for it to make sense to an investor or developer? Um, and that means students and employees. We asked them to look at both. Uh, and do a research-based survey and focus groups so that we could have some real number, real, real data. What were the best locations to build? Look at all sites. Look at all the, the locations on all of our sites. Tell us what they thought would be best. What room types, singles, doubles, apartments, what room types would students like and staff like the best? What rental rates could we get below market and still make the deal work? And then what funding models? We essentially boiled it down to a P3, which is a public-private partnership. You can fund it with general fund, not going to happen. A bond, not going to happen. Or you can use what's called a P3. And so that's what they're going to talk about today uh, at the end of their presentation. But I want to turn it over now to Scion because they're the experts and they're going to tell you what they found out. Ann Voles, Chelsea Mativier, come on up. You are too kind. Make me blush, and that doesn't happen that often. Thank you. Um, so where's our... So really, as you've heard, and, and some of you have met us before, and we're real pleased by the engagement we've had, is Cyan was formed just a little bit about us. We were formed in 1999. And we have never once lost our focus on campus housing. This is what our firm does. We, though, are not a developer. We are not looking to be a management company here. We are not an architect or a construction company. We come long before those entities. And it is our mandate, and it's the reason that we've been successful and we've been able to work with 200 campus communities plus, including, of course, right here, to give very third-party objective advice on, just as Robert said, do you have the demand? And oftentimes, not oftentimes, but there are times when our clients do not. And we've advised either to proceed with housing or not to proceed with housing. It is not in our interest to be advocates that you build student housing. So that is really the process that we've gone through. Chelsea's going to get in more with it. But everything was done with that very third-party objective lens. It's not done with building concepts, architectural drawings. It's very much what does that qualitative and quantitative research say about your campus, your campuses. So that's about us. And it really doesn't matter about us. It matters about here. So um, to. Just talk a little bit here, as we always start off, honestly, and even before in our initial very conversations that were, gosh, I think over a year at this point with all of you, is what is Santa Rosa Junior College? What type of institution? What are those students? And then really looking at what's the right scope of services that we provide for all of you while we have our templates, our processes, our proven expertise that's worked in the market. It is still a tailored process to each individual client. And that also talks about what is that student population look like. And I'm not going to get into this slide with the findings and the recommendations, but we learned a lot even in that initial research that we undertook. And then we really need to look, too, is what's the current state? And as all of you said, and we learned even more today, that there were even tents out on your lawns three years ago talking about housing and homelessness in the area and how can the college do serve their purpose to help the students, the faculty, the um, single family students. How do we, the students with families, all the cohorts, the faculty, the staff, to really provide a quality, affordable residential experience? What's driving that right now? Why are we here on your campus? And of course, the horrible fire that took place a year and a day ago is obviously to put the sense of urgency. The quote we always heard was, you went from a shortage to a crisis literally overnight with, I think, what, 5,300 homes being lost. I'm just so sorry to all of you still for that. And then that student readiness. Is this the type of student that would be willing to and want to live on campus? Do you have a faculty and staff that's ready? Is your campus, is your board, 
Is there buy-in? Do we all believe that this is right for the Santa Rosa Junior College student, faculty, and staff? Now we get a little bit more into the minutia, but also too is the very first thing we need to understand once we got to be engaged with all of you is what are those key strategic objectives that you're looking for with your housing? What are those main drivers? And you don't get 25, we have to make sure because we have to prioritize too, so our recommendations can tie back directly to the strategic objectives of the college and the district. And what we kept hearing, and we, we even heard it as recently as yesterday, is it needs to be affordable. It needs to be attainable that our students can live here, that they can afford to live here, that they want to live here, that your faculty and your staff, that, that, but it's not just affordable, it's a quality residential experience too. So it needs to promote and provide that program of activities that um, academic outcomes that we achieve, and of course, support your mission. Every single one of these objectives has to advance and support the mission. That's just an underlying um, tone to everything. And you also, too, it's not just about the housing, but how does it tie into the non-residential uses? It has to work holistically with your campus, and it even has to serve the non-resident population to create a a hub for the students. Maybe with your new STEM building, there creates a real sense of student centeredness, student activity, student learning that takes place, as we all know, inside and outside the classroom. So I'm going to let Chelsea talk about our process. So as Anne mentioned, it really, um, our process really looks at both quantitative and qualitative data. So we came to campus uh, in April, and we spent three days on campus really hearing from students, staff, faculty, stakeholders, uh, and then disseminated a survey. And we had an incredible result uh, from the survey, 1,735 responses, which for a team that does surveys quite frequently and works on campuses of all sizes, of all types across the country um, and, uh, and throughout Canada, and that is an outstanding um, and astounding result and as quickly as we got it, which really gave us a sense uh, that we're hearing a need, that we're seeing a need, um, and that folks had an opinion, and that's great, that's what we wanted to hear. So as um, we talked, again, a variety of different things that we looked at both from the qualitative perspective hearing and then quantitative, doing our own analysis outside of what your off-campus market looks like, really trying to understand the problem um, from multiple fronts and perspectives. Vote our focus groups. We heard over and over again affordability, affordability on all fronts, and affordability for a variety of type of students and student experiences. Um, and so recognizing that uh, the students who are most impacted in the families, faculty, staff, student, uh, students with families that are also most impacted um, are frequently the ones that are the most underserved in the community. And that ripple effect of the housing crisis, the fires, et cetera, making sure that affordability is number one um, for students. We heard that over and over again. Heard limited supply, heard that increasing rents because of the limited supply. We also heard um, from students who said that they themselves and or their peers uh, had either considered leaving the JC uh, at the end of that term or were already planning to leave the JC because of insecurity, because of instability, um, and needing to find that. So really just thinking about that and taking that into consideration. Again, the survey results really echoed the same thing, cost, affordability, number one issue um, that we heard over and over again, and then again, reiterating the instability that students were already facing, that faculty, staff, um, as well as students with families are already facing uh, in the area. Our market and demand, so we put all of that together and really analyzed the data, analyzed what we heard from all of you, analyzed the off-campus market, and uh, determined that there's a demand for maybe 300 to 500 um, student beds. And so we narrowed that down a little bit more and came up with about median demand, about 350. Uh, we understood um, that 86% of the full-time single students would be interested uh, in on-campus housing. So again, that really spoke to the survey results, what we heard, um, as well as unit types, et cetera, that we had all 
so tested. Um, a, really a reiteration over and over again, we were hearing the same narrative, which told us that that really is kind of exactly what's happening. That reaffirmation is so in, important in our work. Our demand findings, again, a, a median demand of about 350, 350 beds, um, that that would potentially attract a developer uh, so that that would limit any burden on the campus financially. Uh, about 130 beds for faculty, staff, and family students as well. So thinking about that, um, demonstrating that, looking at two different sites at two different campuses, demonstrating that the Santa Rosa campus would uh, be the most financially viable uh, for that demand. Um, and that students with families, faculty, and staff also all indicated an interest in that, of course, being seen in the demand that we have. Can you go over to Whatever. number? Sure. Yeah. So as part of our process, of course, we take all the information we found that Chelsea just shared with you, all those results, and of course they need to lie into a clearly implementable recommendation plan for you. So, and that includes too, as, um, cause we heard in the strategic objective and as Chelsea reminded too, that there shouldn't be any financial burden upon the students, the community, the college, any risk to the college too. So we test all that from a financial perspective as well. So taking all those numbers, looking at all those objectives of the school and determining what are the right recommendations for Santa Rosa. And while it's, it's a recommendation, it's not that you must do this, it, to keep rents the lowest for everyone, for your students, for your faculty, for your staff, if you do do two developments at the same time, because of the economies of scale and because of the increased revenue, that will keep your rents the lowest and create the most affordable quality residential experience. But they aren't codependent financially. One does not fund the other. So they can be built separately. You will just get a lower rent and a better quality project if you build them together. Um, then we really looked, and it's been mentioned to you by Robert and by Chelsea too, is taking that financial risk off everyone I see today in the college is what's very common in our industry is the public-private partnership delivery. And to not get into the weeds of that, but happy to answer any questions about it if you'd like, that transfers the risk away from the school onto a developer and onto ultimately what's a not-for-profit owner. So the developer bears all that development construction risk, the owner bears all the long-term operational risks of it. So I think it'd be best, we also looked at a couple locations and I think Lee is best to address um, the locations. So thank you for that, Ann. Um, there's a couple sites that we've looked at and these are actually properties that we already own. Um, these were actually contemplated during the facilities master planning process of a few years ago because there were members of the 2030 committee who had the foresight to encourage us to, to develop a few sites or at least identify a few sites. So the first one is on Mendocino to my far left over there, the first green box, and it's behind Joe's Coffee. If you're familiar with the parking lot, it's a flag lot. There's a driveway off of Mendocino and also off the side street. Um, and it is directly behind Joe's Coffee. That's actually a, a college owned parking lot. And it has on two sides of it, single family homes and on two sides of it, more of a commercial development. So it tells us that uh, it, because it's in a residential neighborhood, it won't be as tall, and particularly on the two sides that face the single-family home sides, but on two sides, it would allow us to do a taller development. The second site actually has um, even more capacity. Oh, and by the way, that lot over there is about one and three quarters acres, so it's pretty good size. The second lot is to my immediate left here, which is at the northwest corner of the campus. It's at the corner of Elliott and Armory. And it's a combination of the existing Beck Annex parking lot and the adjacent area next to it, which includes the Button HR building and the foundation and the English language school. So if you combine all of those areas into one large parcel, it's about two acres and change. And because of its location, we think we can go a little bit taller in that, in that location. Uh, one of the other comments I wanna make in general is that we are a state agency, so we're not specifically beholden to the, to the city um, height limits and rules. Although we do like to work with the city, we keep them informed so that we're kind of always on the same page 
with them. But what I'm, the reason I'm saying that is it does allow us to go a little bit taller than perhaps what a, a typical city development would allow us to do. And that's a good thing because it, again, allows us to, to develop more units and do a little bit more complex or get, you know, have a little bit more space to, to build what we need to build. Just a, a point that I, I should have actually stated earlier, and it's relevant to this slide as well, is we were on your Petaluma campus yesterday. Obviously, we're here today. And during the process that Chelsea mentioned, we spent about the same equal amount of time, too, looking at each campus. And demand findings really said that the best two locations right now are those for which Lee just showed us. So we got a little bit more granular, too, because in our work, and really looked at what does that housing look like? What are those unit types? What are those preferences for your students, faculty, and staff? And overwhelmingly, actually, because the students right now, you can certainly sense the crisis, said we, we really need shelter. And demand came back, which is not typical, but overwhelmingly for a very traditional we don't use the word too often in our industry, but I will say a traditional dorm style unit. So, and then we also looked at the traditional doubles um, in the industry. For those of you who are in it, we call this a semi-suite. It starts to just get a little bit more of independence as the student progresses or as the developers require. And then obviously too, we look at the apartment style unit that has the kitchen facilities. And then we have to balance all these unit types, too, with what your private developers will be, what will attract them. And typically for first year, or first time, well, maybe second time here, but first time for at least right now, housing on campus at a two-year school, your private development partners and the investors, most importantly, need to understand that if the school, for some reason, would ever go away or something would be a change. It's what they call the exit strategy and how would they convert easily to maybe a market rate use. Not that that's ever the intention of it, but therefore our recommendation, and we would want to let the developers tell us what type of units are best, but most likely it's going to really attract a more of an apartment style unit, which was also seen as favorable and we need to keep in mind, too, that while unfortunately we are in a crisis situation here today, this is a 40-year most likely partnership. So we have to look long-term as well. And different unit types, too. We didn't just test them with the students. We, of course, tested them, too, with your faculty and staff. And that came back, and also your um, students with dependents as well. And that came back uh, definitely as an apartment-style unit type that they preferred to have, which is... Every, no two campuses are alike, but that's very typical that we see. And then, as we talked about, and we were so eloquently reminded yesterday, affordability is key. That is essential. We can build anything we want, and if we're not serving our student population, serving those strategic objectives that we have, well, of course, there's a required financial return. What, how do we keep those rents affordable? How do they stay under that market rate? And the rates that we have here were tested by your students and by your faculty and staff, and they are less than market rate. And please bear in mind, too, the rates that you see here for the student housing include furniture and all utilities. And for the faculty staff housing, they include all the utilities. So it's a one rent payment, which also that's very attractive to your student population as well. Also too is with student housing is oftentimes students don't have credit. They don't, um, they may not even have a cosigner for them. And student housing through that public private partnership allows those students, it's an agreement that all takes place but they don't look for the typical credit requirements that someone that's just a private developer would look for. And just to, to really somewhat wrap up our presentation right here, because we really want to have dialogue with all of you, of course, but right here, this here um, is really proven research in the student housing industry. This is, this is not Cyan, this is not Ann and Chelsea's opinion, but student housing has been proven to really advance academic learning and academic outcomes and is directly linked to GPAs. 
So it's that student engagement that takes place. So we're not here again to promote student housing, just wanted to share some research that we've come across throughout our years in the industry. And again, not science research, but that more of the research that we see in our industry, and I've been in it for 18 years and it tends to stay like this, but um, it really does. It also increases mentorship, diversity. If students are going off campus to find housing, they typically will be with students that are in their area of study or that are like-minded. And when you have a student, you really get that interaction of learning, that diversity of learning, which all leads to, again, those better academic out outcomes that most importantly support your mission. And I guess I should say the typical ones of lower cost and convenience. If you can walk to school, you might not require a car. You might not require a bus or a train pass. So there's so many conveniences to being that right across the street or right on well, both sites are on campus technically. And I think we can explore this if you have any other further questions. If certain schools, if we didn't hear that risk to the school financially is OK, then there would be more options on here. But what we heard from day one was that we don't want to bear this financial risk. We don't want to. We want to make sure our taxpayers are the state. They're all protected. So there is really the most obvious choice is to go through a public-private partnership. And next steps, this is, this is really all for all of you. What's that aspirational state? What are all of you doing? You know, we've, these are our recommendations. We've shared with an implementation plan. Is it campus housing by 2021? Is that what we have here? So these are really not our questions to answer, but those obviously for all of you. And with that, I think we get into some dialogue. Thank you. We wanted to kick off by, you know, I don't know if you'll need this, letting Kathy and Robert speak. Uh, they're part of the committee. And uh, Eric, are there any other faculty here? Sarah. Sarah or Eric, if you want to speak, kind of give a faculty perspective. And so we'll classified perspective, student perspective, faculty perspective, in no particular order. And then we'll go back to the community. So um, in 2016, a student came to me and said, did you hear about this report that we did in 2013 of how many students were homeless? And I was shocked. Um, that, and that's when we did the, the action and we put tents out there in the quad and brought the attention to everybody. And that has now started the dialogue that we're in right now. And then unfortunately, the fires took place and made things even more critical. Um, I was brought in because they said we need some support, and, but as I was brought in for student um, housing support, realized that there's also a lot of people, as myself, um, I, about that time I also lost my house. Um, my landlord sold the house and rent was astronomical, so um, I'm, I'm along with those students. Um, at that time when the students brought that forward to me to help them be their advocate, there was 900 established that were housing insecure. So. Um, and I'm sure that's even more now. Deanna will attest to that's, that, that, that the number has grown up substantially. Um, so I'm very excited that this is going forward, um, that people are listening, and we, and we really want to be more advocates to make sure this, this is complete. Um, I think this will be key for both our students, um, faculty, and staff um, to have some housing available for them so that we can just be here and be um, and be in, be housing secure, not housing insecure, because I think a lot of people in Sonoma County are housing insecure. Um, I was going to say one more thing, but it, I lost it already, so I'll put it over to Robert. Hello, everyone. I'm the student trustee. I am the student representative on the student housing work group task force work group work group. Awesome. Okay, so um, I'm I'm on so many task force and work groups. I can't keep them all straight. Um, so I am the student trustee, and I, um, it was my job to kind of see what's going on, see how we could help students. But actually, um, I, looked, I started looking at this issue about two years ago, because I also saw the study. And um, a friend of mine, the former student trustee, Scott Rossi, some of you may know, also brought this to my attention. And um, so I actually, the first meeting I ever had with Dr. Chong um, and Lee Sada was about two years ago, and we talked about student housing. And I actually really um, want to thank both of you for actually keeping this in the forefront and um, really keeping this on your mind for a long time. I mean, 
you know, after everything that's going on, Dr. Chong and Lee have still really been on it and everyone else and Robert, and I really appreciate that. And so um, it's really cool to see that meeting where, you know, like, okay, well, we're thinking about it. Okay, we know what students need, and, and then now we're here. And so I'm really happy to be here. Um, and so the student perspective is, well, there's a lot of students, like Kathy said, that are housing insecure. And, um, and just to define, define terms, housing insecure generally means um, you're not, so for example, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself housing insecure. I'm at home, live with my parents. Not, I'm not gonna get kicked out, I'd like to think. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I'm pretty secure. I'm not worried, I'm not couch surfing, so going from friends' houses, living in my car, those things, um, living in the creek, which yes, students do. Um, I actually used to be um, a county employee. I used to work in the creeks, and I'd see a lot of people, students including, who would live in our creeks. Um, and right now is a very dangerous time to do that as there is raining. And so um, this isn't just a, oh, I want to be nice. This is a safety thing. There are people who are very unsafe right now and living in an unsafe environment. And so that's something that we need to think about. And our students are living in that environment. And um, we talk with the budget going on and everything. We talk about enrollment. We talk about retention. Well, the best, one of the best ways to retain students is make sure they're safe, make sure that they have a roof over their head, and this is the one of ways to do that. And so I'm really happy that we're looking at that. And um, this is really what students need. This is one of the things that students have been looking for. And, um, and I'm really happy that the, the district is responding to that. We really want to see that. Um, and I cannot stress cheap, 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 cheap. We're looking for as inexpensive. Thank you. Inexpensive, yes. I'm a cheap guy, sorry. Um, so inexpensive as possible as affordable as possible for our students. And that's really the most important thing. Um, because when I brought this to students even two years ago, it was, oh, are they just gonna build it for the rich kids? And we have to say no. We have to say that it is going to, because this can majorly affect our most vulnerable students. Our, um, we have many students who need this, and I mean, any group, doesn't matter what, if you're a person of color, LGBTQ, white, low income, Every group, we have someone who's housing insecure. And so we really need to keep that in mind. Uh, hi, I'm Eric Thompson. I'm faculty and uh, president of the Academic Senate. I want to say two things to start off with. Is, uh, I know that people will come in and out and are checking us out, but this is lopsided. Um, it's just like, it, you know, to invite those of you who are clustered out the door to come further into the room. It's okay if you want to leave, if you need to leave early or whatever. Um, but uh, it, it, there's nobody over here. Lee's sitting in the dark by himself. Um, uh, the, I, I'll just share, I'll, I'll share this thought um, and from a faculty point of view. A couple of things. Um, uh, I, I also really, really wish that there were more faculty here. I, I have spent some time on email exchanges with faculty uh, dispelling and disabusing misconceptions about this project. Um, there are faculty out there who think we're skeptical of this because they think that this is a money-making scheme for the college, that we're building housing for our international students and we're going to make a bunch of money from them. That's one misconception. Um, and th there are a number of others, right? Uh, so I, I, I wish that I encourage faculty to come to this, and I'm sorry that there aren't more. It, unfortunately, this, not because they're not interested necessarily, but the, the schedule, our schedules are really tough. Um, about the housing, I just echo everything Robert said. I've been teaching here for 28 years. Uh, some, of, some of that time as an adjunct, um, most of it as a full-time instructor. And I've had homeless students in my classes. And as I uh, work with students day by day, it's obvious that with all of our state initiatives and all of our um, finagling and legislative initiatives to try to reform education, to get students through better and faster, to get them to be full, full, go full-time instead of part-time. Uh, with all of those efforts, I, I think that we all know that 
in this county at least, the main reason that student success is slowed down is the cost of housing, number one. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, I had a student who couldn't hand in his homework one day because he was living in a shelter and someone stole his textbook, right? Um, another day he was sleeping in the park. Um, so this is urgent and, um, and I'm all for it. I, and I think that the sentiment of the faculty, if they understand it correctly, is that we're all for it. I have strong ambivalence, however, about um, the faculty and staff housing part of it. Um, all in favor of student housing, as inexpensive as possible. Um, I, I have colleagues uh, who, who make less money than, than I do because they're adjuncts, and, and housing is an issue for them too. And I, I would like us to study more um, about that, but I have a strong ambivalence about building on or adjacent to campus housing for, uh, for employees. And speaking as, as a faculty member, I assume that other um, classes of employees might be similar. Um, there are several reasons why I wouldn't want to live on campus or this close to campus. I mean, there's, uh, there's some, I don't know, some profession, good professional reasons for having some separation. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I would, my, my gut instinct, my intuition is that I think it would be a better idea if we built two student housing um, uh, complexes, may, maybe one for f families and another for singles or something like that. Um, but I, I, I know that there are other faculty and staff who feel differently, might feel differently. I think that we perhaps need to study that more. But that's my, my gut reaction to it. Sarah, do you want to come and say something? Is that another faculty member who's here? Yeah, and, that's, and Sarah might disagree with me, but, uh, and that's fine. Uh, yeah. I can handle that. Give, give me that mic. <laughs> um, I'm an adjunct here, and so my perspective on it, I, I share some of Eric's concerns about things I'm worried about. One of them is being available because I'm, I'm somebody who's available all the time anyway, and I know how taxing that is for me now emotionally um, and how much more so that might be if my students could just walk to me <laughs> like they do now, <laughs> chase me to my car. Um, but I also am at a point, and I think a lot of the faculty and staff who aren't full time, or even some who are, are at the point where we're just desperate. Like, you know, build me a mud hut and I'll freaking live in it, okay? <laughs> like, just Sonoma County has become a place where people are desperate. But I also recognize that that's a breeding ground for potentially bad behavior, right? Or negative impacts, right? So I think Eric's right to suggest that we should proceed cautiously and slowly, and we just need more input than, you know, Kathy and I saying, we're broke, like, give us someplace to live, right? Um, I'm also concerned, and I share my colleague Karen Frindell's um, concerns about the safety issues. Um, in particular with the, the lot behind Joe's, um, I really think that if, if we're dedicated to this and we want this to be good and we decide this is something we want to proceed with as far as faculty and staff, if that is the location, then we need community involvement. Like one of the things we need to do is host a session like this where we invite community members in to talk about ways that we can make that part of the neighborhood safer. Um, Speaking as somebody who is concerned, as, as I know a lot of people are right now, about sexual assault and things like this, I don't want to place my colleagues at risk. I don't want to be at risk. Um, that having to make some kind of bargain or choice between my safety and living in a box, uh, you know, those two things, I, I don't want to have to sacrifice one for the other. Um, and so while I think that I, I do I'm a little more gung-ho on this than <laughs> than perhaps some of my, my colleagues. I, I also think that we need to be very cautious about how we do this. Um, I, I don't want it to be a thing where we just jump forward, um, assuming that it, all the details will work themselves out later. So, Stan, you work with our veteran students. Not anymore, but you did. You want to comment on this? Stan is one of my longtime students, uh, and he's extremely wise. 
so much so that he gives me life advice. So. Hello, I'm Stan. I am a STNC at the Hope Center. Um, I used to work at the veterans office. Uh, when I started here in 2014, I was homeless and or insecure, housing insecure. My son and I were staying in my suburban um, with some help from the VA, but I'm blessed. I had that option. A lot of our students don't don't have that option. So I just want to say I'm, I'm glad the discussion is happening and uh, we need to move quicker than not and, and, and get this problem taken care of. Thank you, Derek. Welcome. And Sarah. And Eric. Thank you, Captain and Robert. Uh, so I want to take advantage of our consultants. They're here. They've done the demand analysis. And he, he, they're going to leave after this. So this is your chance while they're in the room to ask them questions or any other questions. And I'll just I'm Scott Conrad. I'm, I'm a parent of two former graduates here, as, as well as an administrator at the college. And I did a little bit of research to just get your question on it. Certainly agree. There's, there's a huge housing challenge here in Sonoma County, as well as most colleges here along the coast with the cost of living. But we have 26,000 students proposed to help 300. That doesn't sound very equitable. That's question one. Second yeah. is the research shows, um, I did a little bit of homework. Uh, there's been a couple of different doctoral research uh, studies done on student success. The most recent, the Brookings Institute study that came out earlier this week mm -hmm. that shows housing isn't one of the top five for student success. Mm -hmm. We're a community college, not a four-year college. Most of the research on housing has been around four-year colleges. There are a couple studies, though, that have been done on two-year. Yeah. It shows that the first-year retention does not improve with housing. Actually, it's worse. Completion does improve at a very high cost. Average cost per bed is $9,000 per year, which is pretty consistent with what you alluded to earlier, but that's just for the bed and the building and the depreciation and the heat. And the other costs, transportation, police, food service, we have a problem with budget already at the college, overinvesting for a small number of folks when instead using that money to help expand the, the assistance we give now to help people find housing perhaps would be a more equitable and greater benefit. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, Scott, thank you for your question. I think we have to, we have to um, make sure we understand the model that they're proposing. The public partner, partnership that their public-private partnership would not incur any cost to us. And it's gonna be a long process, but it's, some, it's how we package all these costs with the developer. So we don't incur those costs. So we're not taking our current funds and dedicating them to 300 beds. So I just want to be clear with that, OK? Right. I'm not sure about your research. I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of research. And you know, you, when, you, when you do a literature review, you, know, you find all kinds of research. Yes. Um, but they're the experts, so I'm, I'm relying on, on their expertise on what they're saying about retention and persistence and all that. Um, 300 beds, right? It doesn't seem like a lot but that's 300 people that we take out of, of the market that are not gonna be competing with, with other people that are, that are in need. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but I think it's gonna have an impact on our community. So I just wanna say that, uh, but please do understand that the model that we're looking at is not taking our money, our funding, and giving it to 300 students. It's creating a model that's gonna be self-funded and it's gonna take care of its own, yeah, including this additional services and cost and all that. Package the, and those costs. The other question or piece of it is if you go to the Chancellor's site, there's currently, I believe, 15 colleges in California, community colleges reported by the Chancellor's office that have dorms currently. Only one of them is not a rural college. And most, when you look at the research, 25% of community colleges in the country have dorms. Most of those, 90% plus, are rural. So the, the model, at least these are publicly funded, they're not the model of funding that you're discussing. So right. I'm curious how many have the model that you're discussing? and how successful yeah. have they been or not. So I can tell you of two, right? Um, Lisa, Robert, I think, and I were uh, last week, we happened to be in Southern California, so we visited uh, Orange Coast College. They just broke ground on 800 beds using this model that, that we're looking at. And uh, it was really impressive to hear what they're doing. They're covering all their costs. Uh, they're able to extend the library hours additional uh, police officers, food services, everything. 
and uh, be able to offer uh, housing at 5% market rate in Orange County, which is really impressive. Uh, so I think if we do this right, if we find the right partner, we can achieve that. Um, the, other, the other college that's, that I know that's moving into this model is Kalinga. They're moving from a, a dorm, a traditional dorm that they own into a public partnership. So this is the trend. Everybody's moving away. Nobody's looking at doing traditional dorms anymore because it's, they're very difficult to, to sustain. And you know, we're not, that's not our business. We're not in the business of running housing. There are experts out there. There's developers that we can use. So uh, I know of two of that here in California that are moving to that model. And there's a lot of universities that are already using that model here in California. Yeah. Thank you. Just down the street, the San Mateo Community College actually has built um, faculty housing at all three of their campuses utilizing the same model. The first time they did it was about 12 years ago. So I just want to emphasize that it, while it's new to us, it's actually been something that's been tested in the marketplace. So we're not uh, the, the bleeding edge. We are going to be the leading edge, though. Okay. And I will, I will say that the, what was impressive to me about Orange Coast is that their VP of Admin and Finance, their Kate Jolly, is totally on board and he is leading the charge. And that means no incurred costs to the general fund. He's very clear about that. And he's been with this for this project for what, two years oh, or three yeah. years now, longer? Well, yeah. yeah. And the school looked at it like all of you for at least 10. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so Orange Coast College and their VP of Finance, he's been engaged in the project really like all of you for almost 10 years, too. So, and they broke ground last Thursday. Um, yes, I'm not sure who this question is pointed towards, but um, so at the end of the 30 or 40 year contract, whatever the district decides, um, when that is done with, does the school incur costs after that of maintaining and everything? Or is that, or would the district then lease it out? How does that work? How is that, I'm not super clear on that. So at the the end of 30 to 40 years, which essentially, that's why I can't give a defined number, A, we don't have a developer on board yet, but it really is typically about takes that lawn to repay the debt that's out on the property. So whether it's 32, 38, at the end of, and there are covenants in the agreements that say that whoever is operating that building needs to keep it maintained. So your capital improvement dollars, whatnot are all um, invested as the as needed, you know, 10 year, 12 year, whatever that requires. So once that debt is repaid, then the property does become that of the college and the district. And that would be up to the college and district to determine what they want to do with it at that time. Absolutely. Um, so that would mean that the profits and the costs of that would be incurred on the district unless the district decides to lease it out again or whatever. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly, that's right. I mean, it's really at that point, it's up to all of you mm -hmm. if you want to take it on yourselves or like you say too, you could lease it out to another private management company. But yes, it's definitely at that point, it's turned back to the college. Unless we decide otherwise. That's right. Okay, awesome, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, I guess my quick question I had was, um, and if there was some research done, uh, this campus previously had Kent Hall, which was the original uh, dorms. I think some folks here have been longer could attest to that. But I was curious um, if there was research done and essentially why that model failed and we knocked it down um, in relation to now, you know, using it as an example of what not to do in the future. Um, and then my second question was just um, um, quality control. So, um, you know, the developer comes in and builds, but to what standards do they build to? Do they build to the college's standards? Do they build to um, the city's standards, et cetera? Why don't you take the type five versus institutional? Sure, yeah. and then you can take Kendall. Yep. <laughs> um, so absolutely, so we really, when we did our financial analysis too, we do look to quality of construction as well, and I, you do really have remarkable architecture on the campus. There's also, so that's what we call institutional quality. Then there's also what's called really a, a type five, which is a very nice quality apartment building. Probably most of what we see in America is mostly 
type 5. That is, can be a very high quality, and the agreements that we have with the development partner that all of you will have with the development partner will define, too, within financial reason, what type of quality can be achieved. Our findings certainly say that it's a type 5 type of construction that you would want to have on the campus. But that is certainly all in the agreement because let's say we want to build the quality level that you have on the campus, that burdens the student rents. So it's very much that balance that we have to make sure that we keep that affordability up there as a very strategic driver. I was here when we had Ken Hall, and I'll, I'll just say what I know, anything else would be conjecture, is that the model was not a model that you typically see used in institutional housing, where you have a live-in manager. We did not have a live-in manager, and I think that's part of, part of the problem. You really need to have a live-in resident director and RAs or resident assistants that they supervise for each floor, each grouping of 50, 60 students. There, there are different ratios. We didn't have that model, and I think that's, that was part of the problem. There's a lot of other reasons, I'm sure. I won't even get into those, but we definitely have to have the model where we have a live-in resident director. And I think you would concur right. with that model. Yeah. So let's uh, go to Sarah. So I had two questions. Um, the first is just what, if anything, and I don't, know if this is specifically directed at you, but just yeah. in terms of how, we've gonna, how we're going to approach this conversation with the larger community, um, how are we going to introduce this idea and what kinds of partnerships do we need to have in place? Because, I mean, part of the rebuild effort here, and I mentioned this in the meeting that we had, is focused on sustainable ha um, housing and making sure that we're not doing things that negatively impact our our environment here in Sonoma County. Yeah, Sarah, to answer your question, we've been in touch and in conversation with the city of Santa Rosa and with the county of Santa Rosa and with supervisors, uh, both on the county and city council folks, to let them know of our intention. And they've all been very favorable to supporting our efforts. And we're gonna form a external advisory group uh, of those folks because when you deal with you know, lines in the city and electrical, uh, that's going to cross over, so we want to get ahead of that. So you're absolutely right. We're going to uh, talk to other folks. We also talked to Burbank Housing. It's the largest uh, affordable nonprofit housing group here, and now something that you had suggested, and I've I followed up with Larry Florin, and we've met with him as well, and he's going to be able to help us out, out as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also concerned, just as a, a side note, about if we're talking to people like that, I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing we need to consider is is talking to the neighbors. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah. Making sure that we're not yeah. like, because I can imagine how that how somebody might sure. feel if suddenly you know yeah. there was this thing there that wasn't there before, yeah. right? Yeah, I was absolutely. And, and typically, when before you do a project like that, you have a town hall meeting with that community, and you get their input. You give them a chance. You that's give what them I'd a like chance. To see. But we're not. I mean, this is we're we're at the point right now where we're really collecting input from our internal community to decide where to go. And I think we need to go back and gather more input from faculty about that site. We're hearing that loud and clear. Once we know if we're gonna move forward with that site, then we would go to the next phase, which would be gathering community input. But we're not there yet, but do, I do appreciate the comment. Though. I just wanna keep it yes, you know, in our important. minds. The, the other question that I had was about um, the satisfaction level. You mentioned that San Mateo um, had been kind of in this process for about 12 years, I think you said. Well. Um, project I was referring to as Orange Coast College, but Lee was referring to San Mateo. Yeah. Um, and you'd mentioned that they had developed the faculty housing. Do we have satisfaction surveys from students and from faculty and staff about how they feel about that housing now? Because I would, I would be interested to see what the people who live in the housing have to say about it. Yeah, I don't, I'm not aware of that, but I can certainly reach out to my counterpart, ca counterpart down there and just see what they have, if, if anything. I'm told that the, San, the College of San Mateo was their first project, and it was deemed to be successful enough where they chose to add one at Kenyatta and one at Skyline, mm -hmm. or at least looked at proposals for those. So I'm assuming that it was successful enough where they would want to you know, continue to, to roll that out, but I'll, I'll follow up. I'm It'd be know. nice to be able to know what people think of their housing. Yeah, right? and you so. asked another question I would just want to touch on earlier. You said, what about sustainability? And I did want to mention from a construction perspective, we can sort of um, work with the team as we develop the RFP to kind of set the standards that we think are appropriate for our college. So that comes down to everything from construction standards and sustainability standards to 
whatever else we think is important in terms of our values. So I think that it's a little early right now, but those are some of the things that the housing work group will probably work with us on as assuming we wanna go forward and how we wanna go forward. Those questions will be asked, so thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I kinda wanted to build a little bit on what David was saying and we you partially answered my question just now, but you know, I think there's unanimity, unanimity that everyone wants this to be affordable, but that we don't want it to be cheap. So how, how do we ensure the quality through this process? I think you know, we can rest assured that the buildings will get built to meet current codes and all of that. Uh, but I, I think to serve the needs of this college and this community, it's gotta be more than just a typical type five apartment building. I think there's spaces and amenities that, that have to be part of, part of it for it to be successful. Uh, and you know, what, what level of control does the college have? Is it just at the RFP level and then once the developers uh, uh, selected, they, they kind of run with it? Or how, how did the college stay involved and make sure that you're getting the product that you want through this process? Very good questions and very good concerns and that which um, all the colleges do have. So it's called a public-private partnership. And please bear in mind that last word's really important because all of you are in it together. And that partnership comes together in its extent. You don't select a developer and say, great. Literally take Orange Coast College that just broke ground last Thursday. My colleagues and myself were on, gosh, hour to two hour long calls every week, working through the minutia of every detail you're talking about. And that balance of the quality and the affordability is really, really key in making those decisions down to every last how many outlets go in the rooms. I mean, that's the level of detail you're working with that partner on. And then there's a partnership agreement that's formed that has just as much college input, probably more, than the private developer. Of course, it has to be within financial reason because the lenders are a part of that financial, that partnership too. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, and Lee might be able to expand Somewhat, upon it further. I guess one additional follow-up to that is, sure. is there room within this financial model for great amenities? For, say, you know, student lounges, student gathering oh, yes. spaces, cafes, et cetera. It, uh, yes. I, when you started to say extensive amenities, I started to picture swimming pools and climbing yeah. walls. <laughs> so I got a little nervous. They have a nice pool. Um, but yes, our, our, actually, the financials that we ran head in the study lounges, those social spaces that are so important to the student experience. Good. Yeah. So um, when we got the survey results, I brought it back to my group, which is the student athletes and, and the coaches, and uh, they asked some questions about the $700 a month rent. So I wanted to um, ask you, how firm could you project that out being? Because when I talked to them, they thought that was a little bit high for what they could do as the coaches, coaches and some of the student athletes. So what I would caution is if it got down the road a, a year or two, and all of a sudden that 700 grew to 900 or something, you're gonna basically, none of our 250 out of town student athletes are gonna stay in a place like that. Yeah, that's, so um, all good questions, all of you. So. Those rents are um, current 2018, and in our pro formas too, we do do a cost of living, which I think we run at 4% in the pro formas. So we get that question fairly frequently too, and it does need to be, bear in mind, that it includes it's all utilities, it's all furniture, it is on your college campus, and when we do our market analysis too, we look at all those factors. So we look at where the students are living now, we have to take it as a per bed count, not a per unit count. And then we have to ensure too that there's, if it's not going to be less than market rate, it's serving some of the purpose but not all of the objectives as well. And the rent tolerances that we found from the students was that 700 with all those factors included works for your pro forma but is also tolerable by the students. Of course, if you're having hearing differently, we'd want to know, but all of our research came back that that was a tolerable rent payment. Hi. Hi. 
Are we there? Uh, Robert Brownlee with the uh, District Police Department. I believe we had a discussion at one point um, when you're out here. So um, my question is regarding security and uh, maybe it's a policy piece and you can give a little bit of an overview of how behavioral issues are handled and public safety matters are addressed. So I'm not, they are absolutely all addressed. I'm gonna ask for a little help too from Robert and Pedro, but those agreements, so we were talking a little bit earlier about the financing agreement and construction quality and affordability and how all those pieces are together. Just as extensive of conversations take place is that operator agreement. And who's going to do what? And there's literally would be a matrix that talks about your operator's responsible for this, your college is responsible for this, and it goes into all of the details for which you're talking about. But I think you guys should maybe expand upon that. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of like the Orange Coast model they're, they're using, Chief, in that uh, Orange Coast hired a director of housing, yes. correct? But Scion's doing the operations, and so they're hiring the RDs yes. and the RAs. Yes. Okay, so that's on the operations side. But there's a director of housing that's a liaison between Scion and the college. So some of the conduct is going to spill over into the college because it's college property. Some of it's going to be dealt with on a lower level by an RA or an RD. But there will be conduct and Title IX issues. And obviously, all the student life, the residential life, is going to be a partnership between operations and the college through the director of housing. So that doesn't get to safety and security. But I think if you looked at their, their matrix here, that could be part of the agreement, that's right. right? That there is another officer uh, as a part of the agreement. But then that's, everything you add is going to change your, your price point, correct? You wanna talk about that more? Sure. I think it's an important thing to. So it's definitely a key partnership and, and going back with everything that Robert just mentioned. And, and when we do our pro formas too, that's even shown here is it's a very unique to housing staffing matrix. It's not like a typical market rate. It does include a lot of student life. It includes, so it gives that student, we want to pull those students out of the classroom because even all the title, even the mental health issues, I mean, all of that is factored into the staffing matrix that we do here. Another piece that I think is essential I should share too is you have a 30 to 40 year ground lease and a deal with your private owner, that not-for-profit owner. It's really not a private owner. The operator agreement is typically more three to five years. Because as time goes on, we don't know, maybe the college wants to be more engaged in the management. Maybe they want to take this piece. So that can evolve as time goes on as well. But it is a very, very explicit level of responsibility matrix that is, even before it goes to financial close, is determined. Does that answer your question? I also wanted okay. to add something to that too. So one of the things about these deals, they're pretty complex because what it is, is it's a balancing point between what we're asking our students to pay and the features that we're offering in the building and, the, and as well as the services. So we don't know the answers to that yet. And one of the first steps that we'll be taking, assuming we go forward, is to ask our community, all of you, to help us determine what our goals and objectives of the project are and prioritize them, right? So if extra police officer and certain student services are at the top of the list, you know, we need to know that so that as we start to go through the features, we know that that's a priority, let's say over a certain, either an another type of feature like a swimming pool or, you know, brick on the side of the building, whatever it is, right? We don't, we don't know yet right now. So these are, this, this would be, those, those ideas would be explored as we get into the next phases and we're gonna need some help with that because the prioritization is important. Pedro, myself, comments, things that we should know. So I have one last one last comment to leave everybody with. This this project that they're expecting that to be done in 2021. In the meantime, we have three years of over a thousand students that are housing insecure, still housing insecure, and we probably will even after we get this finished. We'll still have housing insecure students. So we still need as many people as possible to help with this issue, to, um, to make this go forward, but then also help with our Student Resource Center on how to get other students housed somehow. Um, I already housed two students at different times in, in my, um, my housing um, that were housing insecure. So 
uh, just reaching out and, in, and, and helping um, this center, this resource, find st uh, places for students to live. Now, thanks for that, Kathy. I mean, I think the Basic Needs Resource Centers in Santa Rosa and Petaluma are going to continue to do all they can, but this is really a community problem, and it takes all of us doing just a little bit, referring people to the, the resource centers. So Deanna is the most knowledgeable of the resources in the community and what we can provide for them, and, and just talking to students. Sometimes that's what they want. They want somebody who has an ear can sit down with them and, and tell them about resources. So thanks, that was good. Anything else for Sion? Sion, anything you want to say to close it up? All right, very good. Next steps? Yeah, no, I just, I just want to talk about the process because we want to be transparent and we want to respect uh, governance. Um, so we have a work group and it's an open work group. It's open to anyone that wants to join us, anyone who wants to be part of this conversation. Uh, but I hope you, you understand what we're trying to do right now. This is a listening session. We're trying to come up with the concept. We haven't made any decisions whatsoever. This is just us. We have a, we have a good recommendation from our experts. 350 beds. We're looking at two locations, uh, but we need more input. So uh, going forward, uh, we're going to continue to collect input from, from other groups. Uh, definitely uh, survey faculty to uh, make sure that we understand how they feel about that location and, and how they feel about uh, housing for faculty and staff. And I think Lee is going to help us get some, some uh, information from other colleges. Uh, but this is an open process. So Again, we're just starting the process. We're not, we're not uh, saying this is set in stone. Uh, and I think this is very helpful today to, to uh, help us decide our next steps. But I think I'm not hearing anybody say that we shouldn't do student housing. I think everyone understands the sense of urgency. I think we all recognize it. So we're going to move forward, and we're going to be collaborative. We're going to be transparent. Um, Frank, do you want to say anything? OK, all right. Well, thank you all. Appreciate your, your time and, and thank you for the input.